Okay, my dear friends, shalom, and welcome back to the Lighthouse Project. Shalom, Ami. Shalom, shalom. And um, I want to just start off by asking you, please, just take a moment. If you're, if you're connecting to us digitally, please push like and cheer so that you too can participate in the great work of the Lighthouse Project, which is to spread the teachings of Torah in a form of unity. So, let's start with the sponsors. Uh, sponsor, a merit of the Rafu Shalem of Yosef Yitzchak ben Brocha. May Hashem grant him an immediate Yeshua for good health. Nightly sponsors, anonymous, for the Parsha of Shmuel ben, for the Parnassa of Shmuel ben Rochel. Anonymous, dedicated in honor of the birth of our son, Shalom Baruch, and also to thank Gedalia for his life changing classes. May Hashem always give him energy to inspire so many people. And for the Rafu Shalem of Menachem Mendel ben Sarabatya and the Vorfega Bat Rezel. Um, nightly co-sponsors, anonymous for Rafu Shlema of Chana Krena Bat Rachel, and I take the liberty, amongst all these great sponsors, to also dedicate tonight's class for the ongoing Rafu Shlema of my father, Yehuda Arya Hakoyhein Ben Gittel. Okay, so let's jump right into it. We're going to start, as always, with the modern-day issue. And then we're going to go into the Kabbalah and the mysticism and the Hasidism, and then we'll come back to the practical modern day issue, how to solve it. So what is the modern day issue we're going to discuss today? The challenge of getting into the action. The human plethora of wealth, of intellectual and emotional experiences often leaves the element of action feeling lifeless. In Kabbalah, and Hasidus, we define the four categories of the universe as the speaker, medaber, that's how we refer to the human, the living, chai, that's how we refer to the animal, the sprouter, grower, that's tzomeach, that's how we refer to the botanic, and then there's the silent, the inanimate, domen. Then Kabbalah and Hasidus goes on to explain how they each exist within the microscopic universe, as our sages say, olam katan, the microscopic universe, Zeha Adam, this is the human. Therefore, everything you find out there in the macroscopic world, you're going to have to find it also in the microscopic world. Thus, you have these four categories within the medaber, within the human himself or herself. Okay, so how do they explain that? They explain as follows. Medaber, speaker, this is the power of will. The living, chai, that's the power of intellect. The sprouter, the grower, that's the power of feelings. And the silent, the inanimate, that is action. Letters and action. So now you understand clearly that we're referring to action as lifeless compared to emotions and intellects, thinking, speaking. That's much richer. The person enjoys that much more than the doing the action leaving the intensity of that all to do the lifeless actions. The entire entertainment industry, from reading to cinema and everything in between, is pretty much based on our need to run away from action into either intellect or emotions. So many of our actions are focused on nothing else than to produce the chemicals in our brains which create emotions. How many of us do exercise just because we want to get some endorphins running? So again, it's not about the action. It's about the feeling. Okay? Ultimately, the latest scientific research is now showing that when the body is controlling the brain's pharmacy through action or thoughts to produce chemicals in order to create desired feelings, we are then in active addiction. Thus, the difference between addiction and productivity is whether the mind through the brain is directing the body or whether the body through thoughts and actions are controlling the brain. So again, so much of our body work that we do is really not about action. It's about changing a feeling. One of the things therapists tell us is, move a muscle, change a feeling. So again, it's about the feeling. We seem to have a problem with just plain, pure actions. Okay? In other words, to be subservient in our actions to experience intellectual and or emotional bliss is an addiction while being subservient in our intellects and or our emotions to experience actions is being productive and fulfilling our purpose. Let me explain that. What that means is, if the reason that we have thoughts, speech, intellect, emotions is to drive it into an action, 
then we're being productive. If the reason why we're having actions is to elicit from our brain connections, to create chemicals, to have feelings, that's an addiction. So the productive person actually, his feelings and his thoughts should be driven in order to create the motivation into doing action. That's the productivity, okay? So, nevertheless, more and more we are succumbing to the virtual reality available to us to spike our intellects and our emotions, and the more difficult it is becoming for us to live within the real-time world of action. You have children, you have digital, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Try to get a kid to go today to go out and ride a bicycle. Try to get a kid to throw a ball. It's all in the virtual. Shalom. Okay? In this lecture, based on a mime of the Rebbe delivered in 1978, exploring the difference between the Hebrew letter Hey and the Hebrew letter Kuf, we are going to learn the road to living a productive life of actions filled with higher intellects and higher emotions. So now we know what we're really going to be searching on a modern day issue, practical level. Remember, in Chabad, there isn't a single Kabbalah teaching that is made to levitate us to float out of here. Every single teaching must lead to action, which is precisely what this class is all about. And therefore, no matter what the Rebbe spoke about, whether it was a Talmudic thesis, or whether it was a Hasidic discourse, or whether it was a talk on Rashi, it always ended up with, okay, and what do we learn out from this? How to be practically a better person doing better things. Okay? So that's what this is going to be all about, and that's why all of these classes built on the Rebbe's teachings always begins with setting forth what the modern day issue is, and will end with the practical actions. So the modern day issue is, what is up with our extreme allergy to actions? We will do anything but actions. Okay? Why? And, and needless to say, how many talented, rich, richly talented people cannot actualize their potentials because they're willing to do everything but the action. Okay? Okay. Let's talk about Yutzrat. I shared this all with you last week, but we got to do it again. Because this Friday is Yutzrat. The 10th of the month of Shvat. So last Shabbat was a Shabbat before, this Shabbat is going to be the Shabbat after, and that's why these classes are focused on those discourses. So let's go over it just quickly once again. In 1950, on the 10th day of Shvat, which was Shabbat morning, the previous Rebbe returned his soul to his Maker. And because the previous Rebbe in the latter years of his life suffered from a stroke and from MS, therefore instead of orally giving his public teachings, he actually prepared them in writing and they would be dated by him when to be distributed. Thus we have a series, a four-part series, which actually is dated for the very day of his passing. Those four-part series is made up of 20 chapters. Now, in 1951, the Rebbe officially publicly accepted the position of Rebbe and took the helm of Chabad. And by that, how did the Rebbe start it? By giving a Hasidic discourse. That is the coronation of a Rebbe is practically were taught throughout all seven generations when he delivers a mimer. So all year the Rebbe was doing work but refused to deliver a mimer. It was on this Shabbat one year later, I'm sorry, on this day, it wasn't a Shabbat the next year, that the Rebbe delivered the first mimer. How would the Rebbe deliver his first mimer? He then set up that on this day of the year, which is the day of the passing of, this, of his predecessor and the day that he ascended to the, the seat of Rebbe, he every single year would deliver one mimer on the one chapter of the previous Rebbe's mimer. So in 1951 it was the first chapter. 1958 was the eighth chapter. And there's only 20 chapters. He starts over in 1970, and 1978 is the eighth chapter. This year is the year 2018. So if you keep on following that system, we would be focusing on chapter eight, which is why throughout the world, what we're focusing now on is chapter eight of the previous Rebbe's teaching, the two discourses he delivered in 1958, which we discussed last week, and the one in 1978, which we are discussing tonight. 
Okay, I'm going to once again what I did last week. I have to briefly take you through the beginning of the previous Rebbe's Mimer up to chapter 8 so we can see where the Rebbe is starting from in this Mimer. So let's just do it very briefly. The Rebbe speaks about, the previous Rebbe speaks about how the verse says, I have come to my garden, Basiligani. Doesn't say I've come to the garden. From the fact that it says my garden, it means that God already had this as his primary residence. However, we're taught that sins is doiche ragli ashkina. Sins pushes away the feet of the presence of God. So therefore, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, God left this garden, i.e. earth, and ascended to the seventh heaven. Then, I mean, first seven, whichever way, whichever way you want to count it. And then Cain kills Abel, and he goes to the next one. Then there's the Dor Enosh, which starts idol worship, goes to the next one. And every single one keeps on going up, keeps on going up, until the seventh sin, which happened with Pharaoh, who had the audacity to say, who is God that I should listen to him? After that, what happens? There arises the seven... When I say after that, I don't mean chronologically, as you soon see. But there's the seven righteous people. What did they do? They draw back divine presence. Heaven, heaven, lower heaven, lower heaven, until Moses brings... It starts with Abraham, who starts talking about a monotheism in a world which did not believe in any one God. And all of a sudden, people are talking about that. So now it's on the highest level. The seventh heaven, we're just talking about it. Then it comes to Moses, and what does Moses do? God actually comes onto Mount Sinai, talks to us that we physically hear him. And then what is the, the culmination of that? Make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell within it. Thus, the physical tabernacle, the Mishkan, that was in the Holy Temple, in which we saw miracles every single day, open miracles, that was the physical presence of God. Thus God says, Bati legani, I came to my garden where I was before Adam and Eve expelled me from here, so to speak. Okay? Then the Rebbe goes on to explain. The previous Rebbe, I'm saying, I mean. The previous Rebbe goes on to explain. So now let's look at what the tabernacle was all about. Number one, the main service of the tabernacle is the service of sacrifices. What is sacrifice? Bringing an animal onto the altar. In the microscopic world, what does that mean? Grab your animalistic soul of egocentric passion and apathy and bring it onto the altar. The blood, the passion. Bring it onto the altar. What is on the altar? The fire of God. What does the fire of God represent? The godly soul's passionate love for God. Thus we understand that the process of sacrifice is about what? It's about transforming the egocentric physical to become the theocentric transparency to spiritual. And thus, therefore, because we're dealing now with transformation from darkness into light, the presence of God that came back is far greater than the presence which was there originally. The presence which was there originally was expelled by sin. The presence that Moses brought back is all about transforming sin, transforming egocentric, transforming darkness into light. Then the previous Rebbe goes on in the next chapter and talks about, let's look at another thing in the whole tabernacle. What wood were the walls made out of? Ase shitim. Cedar. In Hebrew, what's the word shitim come from? Shtut, folly. What does the Talmud say? Rosh Lakish says, a person does not sin unless he's overcome by a spirit of folly. So now we understand that there's a spirit of folly which thinks, oh, it's okay. Well, if I do this, I'm not Jewish. No. Not the end of the world. And that spirit of folly allows us to continue sinning. We always tell ourselves, no, 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 that I would never do. <coughs> I never bow to the cross, but come on, really? Suggesting lobster is going to do what to my stomach? I'm still Jewish. That spirit of folly of not being able to stand and say, I have a face-to-face -face relationship with God, where God is not just a spiritual abstract being of faith, but He's in my food, He's in my bedroom, He's in the way I dress. That spirit of folly leads us to sin. Thus, what are we being taught? 
to build a tabernacle, you need to grab that spirit of folly and transform it into a total different spirit of folly. So if this is normal, folly can mean below or above. Below is what I just explained. Above is that irrational level of commitment and passion that we have for God. And thus you'll see the insanity of a Jew works all his or her life to achieve fame and power and then somehow because of the spiritual hunger within walks away from it all to just say I want to be with you God in a simple life. That's when we transform the spirit of folly of pursuing egocentric to say you know what I'm going to do something completely irrational for the sake of theocentric. Then comes the next chapter, which gets us into chapter 8, which says, and what are those beams called? In the Torah, they're called krashim, plural. You know that in Hebrew, I am, yud mem, really, is plural masculine. So one beam is called a keresh. Keresh is spelled by the Hebrew letters kuf resh shin. If you rearrange those letters, you have the word sheker. Sheker means lies falsehood okay that's where we're up to in chapter 8 now last week I, I have a whole handout and I posted it and, and, and I uh, also um, emailed it out to anyone who gives me their email this time I don't have the entire package we don't need it for this week I just want to share with you quickly the letters okay so there is the evil letters it's called Asvin the Bishin. Those are the Resh and the Kuf. There are the letters of holiness, which is the Dalid and the He. I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, Dalid and the He. Okay? I also want to introduce you to the letter Shin, which really doesn't play a big role in what we're going to talk about, but it does play a very fundamental thing. Let's get it out of the way quickly. The sages tell us, in the, in the book of, of Mishli, I believe it is, what does it say? Oh, Proverbs, I'm sorry. I'm going to quote to you the verse by King Solomon, chapter 12, verse 19. A true tongue will be established forever, but a lying tongue just for a moment. Rashi grabs the word just for a moment and explains why. In a fleeting moment, it perishes and leaves. And here it became a very coined quote. For falsehood has no feet. Sheker en lo raglayim. Now the simple interpretation of that is, look, the kuf, one leg, it's going to topple. Even the resh doesn't have the balance of the dalit, it'll topple. That's what we mean. The hay, unlike the kuf, is sturdy. Even the dalit has that balancing you there. Thus becomes the question. Whoa, 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 one second. Sheker is not just kuf and resh. Sheker is also shin. What could be more sturdy than the shin? Right? So what does Rashi mean? Has no feet. It's got a total base. For this, we're going to have to turn to the Zohar, which talks about it. And he says these words. I'm going to, it's basically a quote what I'm telling you. He says that those evil letters, Kuf and Reish, grab the shin and pull it. Why? Because remember we spoke about this so many times. Nothing, there is no dualism. There is nothing but God. Satan is an angel of God. Ultimately speaking, Satan is a piece of God. For God is everything and everything is God. There cannot be no dualism because in the deeper meaning of hero Israel, God is our God, God is one. We don't mean to say that there's one God and not two gods. What we mean to say is everything is God and God is everything. And I explained it last week that God did not go to Home Depot shopping for material to build the world. The material of the world, the very mass of the world is from himself. And thus God knows everything because he knows himself. What this is going to mean to us right now is that everything must receive its life force from divinity because there is no other life force. 
If there is no other life force, then how does evil receive its life force? Therefore, they had to kidnap the Shin. The word of the Zohar is, by kidnapping the Shin, it still can't nurse directly from it. The Shin is a face-to-face -face letter. It's a holy letter, the light of holiness. It doesn't, ex it doesn't connect with the darkness. Thus, what the Zohar tells us is, and these are the words, Ha'ara de ha'ara de ha'ara, array of array of array of life force. It has to go through all those contractions, descents, and concealments until there is that minuteness of divine life force from a letter of light, which now gives some existence to the kuf and the resh, the letters which are the shadow of darkness. Now we understand why there's a shin there. I'm going to put this out here now. Remember it, because I'm not going to come back to it later when we're supposed to. I want to get onto our modern day issue. What you now understand is how transformation can happen. If kuf and resh, if evil was only evil, you can never transform it. For the same reason, you and I are not allowed to eat pork. For whatever reason, pork comes from the other side. Therefore, even if you made a blessing, even if you invited poor people, and even if you spoke words of Torah, and you had a lachayim, the pig will not be elevated. The Hebrew word for prohibited is asur. In modern day Hebrew, what do you call a prisoner? Asir. The morning blessing, what do we say? Matir asurim, who unties those who are tied. The Kabbalistic meaning of the word prohibited means it's tied down, it cannot be elevated. Evil cannot be elevated. So how do we transform evil, darkness into light? So if you remember I shared with you that in the process of the 365 prohibitions, what do I do? I can't tell God I do this for you. Rather, when I walk by in the morning and I'm really hungry and I see the breakfast special, the double burger fries and coke that is in McDonald's and the smell comes out and I know that if I go to the kosher store I'm going to pay eight times the amount of money for a third of the food and I look up to God and I say, God, no, this one's for you, I will not. Thus you were able not to elevate evil, evil but to crack evil. What happens when you crack evil? It's prison of the shin, which is the spark of divinity, the life force, can now be transformed and elevated. Thus the shin will play a very big important role, but it's not what we're going to focus on. So know that you cannot elevate the evil by direct contact. I'm going to engage with you. Rather, you elevate the evil by cracking it, by saying no. It tempts you, it persecutes you, and you say no. Why am I saying no? If you're in a relationship, you know that when you tell everyone who's outside of your marriage no, what you're really saying is yes to your loved spouse. So the no is a yes, because there's nothing else I can do with evil but say yes to God by saying no to it. Thus cracking it, balancing out the global power between good and evil, and the shin, the prisoner, has been freed. Thus there's a transformation. Okay? Thus I could use pork to get close to God, but not by making a blessing and chewing on it, but by saying no. Okay? With that said, let's go further. So the shin is not the part of the word keresh that we have to worry about. The shin is okay. What do we have to f uh, transform from sheker into keresh, from falsehood into beams of the holy temple, the house of God? We got to deal with the other two letters, which is the resh and the kuf. Thus quickly, let's just wrap it up quickly. Where do we see that the resh and kuf is so evil? Because when Joseph was sold into slavery, what's the first thing they did? 
They threw him into the ditch. What was the boil? Reik aim by Mayim. It was empty, it had no water. Thus our sages, remember I quoted to you the Talmudic teaching. What's going on here? The Torah doesn't say extra words. If it's empty, it has no water. So why does it say empty, it has no water? From here we extrapolate. It was empty of water, i.e. goodness, life, Torah. What was it not empty of? Scorpions and snakes. Mayim embo avlakravim unachashim yeshpo. Right? So now that we know that, we know the kuf and the resh is what's the problem? They fall into the nether pit of evil. Now, let's understand something. There's a verse. Where is that verse? It's again from King Solomon in Kehelet, Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 14. And what does he say? Ze le'uma ze asa lukim. The exact translation. God has made one corresponding to the other. Thus, the Chinese proverb really comes from King Solomon. There is no light without a shadow. And in a very real way, the shadow completes the light. So it is that there is no Jacob without an Esau. There is no animalistic soul without a godly soul. There is no godly soul without an animalistic soul. Going back to the Medrash on the sin of Adam and Eve, it's really like the yin yang. It isn't complete black, it isn't complete white. The black has a dot of white and the white has a dot of black. Because the Medrash says from the day that Adam and Eve ate, there is no good without bad, there is no bad without good. Even deeper than that, we find the Talmud says another statement, there is no land creature which doesn't exist also as a sea creature. There's always the correspondence. Let's get to what we're talking about. In evil and goodness, there is nothing in goodness that doesn't exist in corresponding in evil. There is no evil that doesn't correspond in goodness. Thus, if the letters Kuf and Resh exist in evil, there are corresponding letters in light. So if you have these letters which are shadow of darkness, you're going to have corresponding letters which are the letters of light. Now we'll look at which they are. The corresponding level of the Dalit is the Resh. You actually remember, they literally almost look exactly alike. The corresponding letter of the he, of the Kuf is the He. So now let's start with here. What is the difference between these two? The difference between these two is simply that the Dalit is not round, it has a Yud. So we need to talk about the Yud. What is that dot that it has in the back? Yud is the first letter of what? Of God's name. Is ineffable tetragrammaton, right? So Yud is a letter of holiness, not just a letter of holiness. Yud is small, it's a letter of humility. Humility equals what? Transparency. Thus the Yud is not only holy, but on top of the letter Yud, there's a Kutz. If you look at the Torah, the way the Torah writes it, it's not just like this. This would look like a Yud, not in the Torah. In the Torah, there's a thorn that goes up here. In Kabbalah, that thorn is a supernal crown. Because of the humility of the Yud and the transparency of the Yud, it can house the true infinite light, the supernal crown, the circular, infinite, all-encompassing. Now, when you have that Yud, that will lead that you should always have a connection with holiness. Now I want to share this. You know that in Hebrew, we write from right to left. If we write from right to left, that means that this Yud is in back of the letter or in front of the letter? It's in back of the letter, because we're writing this way. Right? So I want to share with you what this Yud is all about. It seems to be that this Yud really is in the back. So even the Dalit isn't such an ay 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 person. It's not like the hay, which we'll soon see, which in the Torah, this literally looks like a Yud, which has a Yud in the front. Its Yud is in the back. However, here is an interesting thing. We are taught that because holiness, the godly soul, because we have within us the godly soul, which is the Yud, even by a person where this Yud is in the back, it does not have dominance. 
It's actually, you know how many times when you have right smack in the middle, you're going to do something wrong, and there's a little voice here, and you say, really now? Go away. <laughs> Come back later. Even when you do that, the yud is still there. So even though the yud is in the back of thought and speech, our thought and speech is egocentric because the yud is in the back. However, there is a verse and we learn out from that verse a ruling. Lo yidach mimenu nidach. God says, I will not push away the banished one. Thus, ultimately, we are promised that if you have within you the Yud, even if you shoved him in the attic and you locked him in a, in a suitcase and all your life you kept him telling your, your, uh, your, um, your conscious, let's call it the conscious, your good conscious, leave me alone, leave me alone, do me a favor, leave me alone. And you thought contrary to what your conscious wants you to thought. And you spoke contrary to what your conscious wants you to speak. The mere fact that you have the Yud, you have that truly a piece of God within you, thus there is the ruling upon you, Lo Yidach Memenu Nidach. By the way, that is carried in law. The Alter Rebbe, who wrote a code of Jewish law, he uses this as a law. When it says that you're not allowed to study with someone who is unworthy, who isn't behaving proper, appropriately, he talks over there and he quotes, you have it in Maimonides, he quotes that nevertheless Torah that you learn for egocentric reasons will eventually redeem you. And he quotes our sages which says, not the light, but the source of light that placed himself within the Torah, the Yud within the Torah, Machzir and Lemotiv will bring you back to good. And there in that code of Jewish law, right there in chapter, I think it's chapter 4, law 3, in the laws of Talmud Torah, the Alter Rebbe says, and therefore, we have the promise of the verse, Lo Yidach Memeno Nidach, and you could study Torah with the person. Thus, not only is it a law that before Mashiach comes, we're going to do Teshuvah, it's a law that we can act now with Jewish people who seem to be less than deserving to study Torah. Each and every one of us, you know, I know what I do, you know what you do, and we wonder, really, do we have the right to utter these words with this same mouth who spoke gossip and did all the other stuff? Nevertheless, because of the Yud within us. Now let's talk about this Yud. This Yud is the power of Teshuva. Why is this Yud the power of Teshuva? Because we're taught that even when a person sins, there's a piece of him that refuses, remains detached, and thus doesn't get stained. But Amna Itoi, even at the time of sin, he is completely faithful to God. <coughs> there is a piece of us that will not participate in our sins. Thanks to that peace that remains pure, I can later do Teshuva. Because that is my connection out of this mess. Thus this yud of a dalit, even though it's in the back, even though I am a sinner, and even though I keep on telling my conscience, just shut up, leave me alone. Come back to me on Shabbos. <laughs> right now I got to make a living. Thus you may say I shun it. Nevertheless, the fact that I have it is what saves me. Now let's go back to our class. What does that mean? If you look for a moment at the kuf and at the hay, you will see that the hay, I'm covering cover this up, is a dalit. You'll see that the kuf is a resh. Thus the dalit evolves into a hay, while the resh evolves into a kuf. So when you look at the kuf, you're looking at dropping below the line. I made it small, but really when you write, the kuf, this part ends down here and this part goes down into the nether pit of scorpions and snakes. Why can the kuf fall? It can only fall because it evolved from a hay, it evolved from a resh. 
Thus it never had the Yud, therefore it can go down and go down and go down. But the Dalit that had the Yud, even though it's in the back, it can never turn into a Kuf. Not only it can, it can never turn into a Kuf, it will eventually be transformed to a He. The He is one of the letters of God's name. Actually used twice. Yud Kei Vav Hei. Okay? But this is not today's class. Why is it not today's class? Because we're talking about thought and speech. Thought and speech. What we really want to talk about is action. Two lines, thought and speech. The third line is action. So now, let us go ahead and jump into the letter He and the letter Kof. Okay? What I want to emphasize to you is that even though the Resh doesn't have the Yud, the Resh still didn't fall beneath the line. Thus ultimately, the Resh isn't the point of no return. What is the point of no return? And I'm just quoting the words of point of no return. There is no such thing as a point of no return. Because if you, are, you have a neshama, we just said that lo yidach nidach. God says there is no point of no return for my kindalach. But nevertheless, what happens here? The kuf. As long as the reish has not evolved yet into a kuf, it's not that bad. The kuf is where we fall down into the nether pit, the boy rake, Embo Mayim, but has scorpions and snakes. So really, what's it all about? It's not about the first two lines. It's not about the thought and the speech. What it's really all about is the third line, the action line. This will make the true difference between holiness and evil. So really what it's all about is action. Egocentric thoughts, not a good thing. Egocentric speech, not a good thing. But they're still above the line. They're still not in the scorpions and the snakes. Egocentric actions, we're talking about a whole different ball of wax. Thus the main focus here is not on the Dalit and the Reish as much as it is on the Kuf and the Hay. And within the kuf and the hay itself, we're not focused on the first two lines, we're focused on the third line. Thus the main focus will be on action. Okay? So, I want to just talk a little bit about this. Let's first get something straight. If you women were to meditate on the spirituality to the point of emotionally and intellectually connecting yourself with what Shabbos candles do. Right there, it's time, to, it's time you're about to start Shabbos, and you decide, what, I'm just going to run, you know, with my hair still wet, with a towel wrapped around to light the candle? Hmm. And you really meditated, and you really emotionally opened yourself up to the sublime light of Shabbos. But oops. It's too late, you can't light the candle. One scenario. That person did not do the mitzvah. Comes along the other woman. Who's still wrapped around in her towel turban. Grabbing herself like this and she's looking for her slippers and she has no time. And please set up the candles. Comes running in and literally without any feelings or intentions or any kavanah, just from habitual behavior, rattles off the blessing, then, no, 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 thank God I made it. That person did the mitzvah. Thus you see in Judaism, 
All the spirituality is beautiful. But what's the main thing? The action. What will define if you did or did not do the mitzvah? The action. So if you want to meditate your way into heaven, which by the way, I'm not ridiculing it. It's really important. We're taught clearly in Tanya that your mitzvah is a body. And the body of a bird needs wings to fly. The wings are love and fear. So feelings is literally what takes your, your up to heaven. But wings without a body isn't going nowhere. A body without wings can still be salvaged. If you watch the Facebook channels that I watch, you'll see actually that they actually build sometimes wings. And if you had my kids and you watched the famous dragon movie, <laughs> they even built him a tail. <laughs> but you can't build a dragon if there's no body of a dragon. Thus you understand the emphasis is action, action, action. I want to take it a step further and I want to carry you through a couple of interesting things, okay? Number one, when it comes to mitzvahs of articulation, i.e., you have to recite the Shema twice a day. So you know how most of us read with our eyes? You should know that if you do that for the Shema, you did not say the Shema. You've got to articulate it. And then we have the ruling of our sages, Akimat Svatayim. Heavy Misa. Movements of the lips is considered action. There's another verse. There's a verse that tells us, I read it to you. For they are life, we're talking about words of Torah. For they are life for those who find them. The word find them in Hebrew is lemotzi ahem. So I want to share with you what the Talmud says. The word motzi ahem means find them, but it also means to take out from the word letzet. Right? Two words. So watch what one of the sages in the Talmud did. Samuel said to Rabbi Yehuda, Shinina, keen with it. Open your mouth and read the scriptures. Open your mouth and learn the Talmud that your studies may be retained and that you may live long. Why? Study is in the brain. What, why do I need the lips? Since it is said, for they are life unto those that find them and a healing to all their flesh. Read not to those who find them, lemotzi ahem, but to him who utters them with his mouth, lemotzi ahem bepe. Thus we now see that what? Even the commandments that are only about the lip service, prayer, it has to be lip service and not mind or eye reading service. Let's take it a step further. There is also another verse. You know what, before I go to the other verse, it gets a little complicated, let me just tell you, what's about the laws of the heart? And you shall love God your God. And you shall, God your God, you shall fear. How do you do those with action? That's a feeling. So you look at the Rambam, and I want to quote you what the Rambam says. In the opening, in his book, he has the laws of the foundation of the Torah, chapter 2, laws 1 and 2. Let me tell you what he says there. He says, mm -hmm. And how is the way to love him and to fear him? By contemplating in all one's actions. You women all know, <laughs> the husband that tells you, the boy that tells you, I love you, <laughs> but didn't buy flowers and doesn't help you with the dishes. That's a love. In New York we used to say, that and $1. twenty-five, you can get on the train. So the Rambam clearly defines love Hashem. By the way, you should know that the, the Rebbe doesn't bring it in this mimer, but I myself learned from a different discourse of the Rebbe that he brings a different proof of action, which is interesting. He quotes his father-in-law to say that when your heart is love, it literally expands. When you're living in fear, you contract. So he talks about just like the movements of the lips, the feelings are the movements of the heart. Here the Rebbe gets more detailed and says, I'm not just talking about what it does to your physical heart, I'm talking about practically, action, action, action. Love God with action. Fear God with action. Okay? So even feelings. 
Then I want to share with you another teaching. This is a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov's successor and the Alter Rebbe's teacher called Rabdov Ber Mizrich, known as the Magid. He quotes another verse, and he says in this verse as follows. It's a verse, a verse from Leviticus. You shall observe my statutes, which a man shall do and live by them. Okay? Do and live by them. So he has a very interesting teaching, which is more mystical teaching. He says that when you do, you bring life into them. In other words, your physical mitzvahs are lifeless. Tefillin is lifeless. Tzitzis are lifeless. Right? Leather, skin. The lulav is a dead branch. You can't shake the lulav what's on the tree. Right? So all of them are lifeless. When you do the mitzvah, you bring life into it. And he goes on to explain. What does this mean? It gets very interesting. The way divinity works is you have, like I told you, the thorn of the yud, the highest level, the supernal crown. That has to fit, go through the intellect. Then it has to be connected to the emotions. The emotions have to be connected to the thought. The thought has to be connected to the speech. None of these are unified until action comes and all of a sudden they all become one and are delivered into the physical action. Very interesting. Have you ever heard of the word Seamus? The word Seamus literally means names, Shemot. But what does it really mean? If a piece of your siddur gets ripped, you use the siddur, you can't throw it in the garbage. You have to bury it. Tefill and become non-kosher. You have to bury it. A Sefer Torah gets burnt. God forbid. We're not talking about that it just gets from usage. A Sefer Torah that gets burned, you perform a funeral for it. Why? Why? And the answer is because of what we just said. When you do the action, then all of a sudden every level from the highest till the bottom unites and permeates. I want to take it another level. That means when you think and when you speak, it doesn't happen. Only when you do does the Holy Maga tell us that that action has a way to just grab everything from the top to the bottom and bring it in. By the way, in Hasidus, they quote as the metaphor of the levar. What's the levar? It's a lever. If I want to pick up a whole bunch of stuff, where do I have to put the stick under to lift everything? Not the middle, the bottom. Thus so too, the action lifts everything. From the, from the Magi we learned that not only it lifts everything, but how does all of divinity from the highest of the highest permeate all the way down to the lowest of the lowest and not just be fractured levels is only through action. By the thought and by the speech that doesn't happen. And thus the law is, you're studying Torah. It comes time to do a mitzvah that you physically have to do. It's an individual mitzvah, not a global mitzvah. I.e., light the Shabbos candles. You have to stop learning Torah and go ahead and do, do the action. What happens if it's not an individual mitzvah? It's a global mitzvah. For example, bury the, bed, the dead. There isn't an individual who he has to bury. Let's talk about it's not children to a parent. But the Jewish body must be respected and buried. If there's no one else to do it, you have to close your Chumash, close your Tanya, close your Talmud, and go to it. Because the action is what dominates in Judaism. Thus, parenthetically speaking, I've shared this all the time. You go to Tibet and you ask your guru, I'm missing spirituality in my life, he'll tell you, can you meditate on a treetop or on a, on a mountain? You ask a rabbi, I'm missing spirituality in my life. He's going to ask you, when was there a homeless person by your Shabbos table? Because to us, 
spirituality will not unite and permeate unless there's an action. In other places we talk about emotions are fragrance. It's a passing smell. Unless you have an action to absorb it, then it stays. Action, action, action. Now the question is, why? Why action? Why couldn't it be thinking? So the answer is, there's a rule in Kabbalah, quoted in Hasidus all over the place. Kol ha-gavoa, gavoa beyote, yored lemata, mata beyote. That which is higher, higher, extremely high, falls lower, lower. Okay? Thus, when you see the lower, you're actually looking at something that comes from higher. Thus, in some format, the fact that action is lower tells me that it's really higher. I, I didn't quote this in my notes. I'm just going to throw this out there. By the way, in Kabbalah, we have a big problem with the, with the food chain. Because in Kabbalah, the big can never live off the little. The little has to live off the big. And yet, in, in food chain, it's the opposite. The human lives off the animal, which lives off the plant, which lives off the mineral. So in Kabbalah, the whole food chain is a problem. The answer it gives is what I just said. The fact that the minerals fell the lowest is a proof that it comes from the highest source. So if you apply the rule that the higher, higher falls lower, lower, I now understand why the source of all sustenance, as King Solomon says, all comes from the earth, the inanimate. Okay? But we need to get a little further here. Why is it that the lower, the action, really is higher than everything else? From the speech, the thought, the emotions, the intellect, the will. Why? So to understand this, the second Lubavitcher Rebbe gives three metaphors. We're going to go through the three metaphors. Metaphor number one. The torch. The bigger and more powerful it is, the further it shines. Thus the power of the torch is expressed where? In the furthest place it shines. Oh, this torch shines for 100 feet. This torch, only 50 feet. But if you go to the mark, the line of 100 feet of the bigger torch, you're going to have a very weak light. That means that its power is expressed not by where it's strongest, but where it's weakest. The mere fact that it can get all the way there tells me how strong it is. However, there it's very light. Light as in light, <laughs> dark. Thus the same way in spirituality. The power of the spirituality is that it reaches so far. Where is far? The physical realm. Even though in the physical realm, the light is very weak. One explanation. The next explanation. A barrel of water. How can you tell how full the barrel is when it's exploding by the seams and little drops are coming out? So again, how do I see how full the barrel is by the little drops that are coming out? And these little drops are so minute and nothing compared to all the water that's in it. So too, once again, with spirituality. How do I see the power of the divinity is in the little drops that squeezes and bursts out from the spiritual into the physical? The second metaphor. The third metaphor is very interesting. I I'm going to just speak openly. We're all adults here. But we're going to talk about reproduction. In reproduction, you can't have reproduction until you reach puberty. Puberty, halachically, is a sign of intellectual maturity. Because you can't have an erection if you don't have a certain level of dot maturity. 
so too you can't have an ejaculation. So on one hand, the sign of reproduction is the sign of maturity and intellect, right? You can have that. A child cannot do that. And yet, what is reproduction all about? The smallest tiny drop of semen. So again, the power of the human reproduction, which shows the greatness, expresses itself in the smallest. So too the power of divinity, of being able to show its greatness, is that it can reproduce into the physical. However, what exists in the physical from divinity is but a little quoted mission and ethics of our fathers, a putrid drop. The Rebbe here goes on and says that the reason why there's three metaphors is because each one explains more than before. But the Rebbe does not explain it. I am going to make an attempt just on the third one. Why do we have to get into this? You know? <laughs> I have enough problems with the world thinking that Kabbalah is a sex book. Why do we have to get into this? I'm going to share with you my own thoughts on this. So again, I'm going off record. This is not the Rebbe's Mimer. This is my thoughts on it. Obviously based on teachings of Ranat and other teachings. Reproduction is a very interesting process. Reproduction is where the parent has to reach into the deep essence of their being. Because unlike a student-teacher relationship, it's transmitted through thought and speech. Because the teacher isn't creating ex nihilo, something out of nothing. He's taking the ex, the student, and he's reforming it. So that's an act of formation, not an act of creation. What you bring me, I will reform. And therefore, because the formation I'm trying to do is to take the egocentric and make it theocentric, take the selfless child and teach him how to think and feel like a selfless adult, Thus, it's all done through the finer spiritualities. A transmission of intellect, a transmission of emotions, a transmission of thought and speech. In creating a child, you're creating ex nihilo. Thus, what the parent has to produce in order to create a child is the very essence, the very existential drop of his being or her being. Thus in Kabbalah language, the teacher-student is all only about transmitting the expressive light. The father-son is about transmitting the essential, existential essence. Thus I'm going to say that this is the quintessential metaphor for what we're talking about. Let's go back to what the Maggit said. When you only have emotions, you only have intellect, you only have thought, you only have speech, what are you dealing with? The expressive rays of light of divinity. What is that one thing that truly produces ex nihilo, bringing the essence of God, the essence of divinity, is action. And thus we're talking about only a tiny drop of semen that has a DNA ladder, but that DNA ladder is something that a teacher can never give a student, but a parent gives a child. Thus the only way we can really bring the essence, the DNA semen, so to speak, of God, into the physical world, the only way we can really make this the house, not of God's revelation, of God's expression, but of God's essence. How do we bring the essence of God into our lives? Not the teachings, the feelings, the spirituality, the abstractness. How do we bring the essence of God? How do we become God's child, not his student? Only through action. Thus, this third metaphor really hits it on the nail. 
Thus we understand if we do everything in Judaism. Oh please, I'm a good Jew at heart. Oh, I, I you know, traditionally, you know, I believe and, you know, and I feel and I, I kvetch and I know how to say oy vey. But if it isn't the action, then you're not creating a child of God. You're not drawing God's essence into an internal legacy. Thus we now understand why the Rish and the Dalit is not as important as the Kuf and the He. Because that little third leg, the detached leg, is what it's all about. When the He has that detached leg above the line, now we're talking about action. Thus we're talking about truly building a house for the essence of God. And God forbid the kuf is drawing the essence into the other side, into the snakes and the scorpions. Thus we understand that even though we talk about the three lines of the hay and the three lines of the kuf, the main focus is, tell me not what you feel and what you think, tell me what you do. Action, action, action. So in closing, let's wrap this up. Let's go back to our opening concept. Why is it that so many of us love the intensity of the higher human faculties, of hypothesis, the mind, extrapolations, beautiful, the intensity of feelings. You know it's a good movie if you cried. The intensity of thought. Oh my God, I will argue with you what this community has to do for hours. I'll think about it. I'll talk about it. The one thing we struggle with is do a lifeless action. Get up and just do it. The answer now becomes very clear to us. Because as long as we're thinking of feeling the intensity of self, you're going to get stuck in everything but the action. So what's the answer then? The answer is to shift from the 12 carat zirconian to the half a carat diamond. Let's move from quantity to quality. Yes, in quantity, feelings, thinking, talking, all those stuff is beautiful. In quantity. Okay, all right, guys, coffee break's over. Everyone go do your little things. And you think to yourself, why do I have to do this? You know, more and more computers are taking over action. Let us do the spiritual stuff. But if you think about quality, one action, one action makes it existential. It makes it real in quality. Almost as... The comparison of having a child versus writing a poem. You know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, the child is a messy, <laughs> a messy creature. And sometimes he's on your nerves. But to write this poem and just put yourself out there. No, you tell me. Which would you rather do? Write a poem or create a child that would carry a legacy? Action. Action, And that's why it says, he who brings up the child of a friend is as if he or she gave birth to them. The action, the action. Don't talk to me how rich you are in feelings. You have such a sensitive, oh, he's so feminine, so sensitive. He's in touch with his feelings. He cries. He's not talking about anything and he's already a mess. She's brilliant. She'll figure it out. All great. Action, action, action. So stop thinking about the quantity of self and the intensity of that and start thinking about the quality of self. And then you realize one action is greater than hours of meditation. Thank you.